Well, good evening, everybody, in person and virtually. I welcome you all to our special speaker series. And uh, before I go further, I'll introduce myself. My name is Rajiv Singhal. I'm the interim associate dean at the SBA. And you'll have to take my word for it. You know, you cannot see my face, but you'll have to believe that I'm indeed the interim associate dean. Uh, at Oakland University, we have established diversity as one of the pillars. And uh, in consonance with that, at the SBA, we are laying a lot of emphasis on issues related to diversity, equity, and, and inclusion. So we, by we, I mean SBA Career Services, is hosting a speaker series. We are inviting community members and also employers to talk to us and the students about uh, how the community is changing and uh, the impact that it's having on the workplace. So we are pleased, very pleased to have Marvin Figaro. Marvin is the talent acquisition and sourcing manager at Kelly Services, a solid 18, 20 years experience in staffing behind him. Uh -huh. And currently he's uh, heading a team of uh, talent acquisition professionals. And uh, basically, responsible for sourcing strategy and talent uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. So, Marvin, I welcome you, and uh, I'll be in the audience. And uh, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. So since we're uh, appropriately socially distanced, yes. I will. Uh, <laughs> yes, I will remove my mask. So, thank you for that introduction. Um, Yes, uh, my name is Marvin Figaro. I'm the Talent Diversity and Sourcing Manager for Kelly's Global um, Corporate Recruiting. What that means essentially is I wear two hats, right? So one of my responsibilities is that I lead a team of sourcing specialists that provide what I like to call um, recruiting enablement, right? So it's everything that the recruiters either don't have the capacity or bandwidth to do, right? Upfront sourcing, we do some training, right? Some innovation around sourcing tools and tactics and techniques. We evaluate a ton of sourcing tools just to make sure that we're frontline on what's happening in the sourcing industry, right? Um, that enables the recruiters freeze up their time to focus on candidate engagement, candidate experience, stakeholder management, and that sort of thing. Um, my team, two of them sit in Budapest, and I have two that sit here in the US. Um, I'm also looking. So, you know, anyone that wants to be a sourcing specialist or strategist, mm -hmm. let me know. Um, when I'm not doing that, I'm more also responsible for talent diversity. So very broadly. What kind of uh, background yeah. do you need to be required for your uh, for one of your positions? To be a sourcing specialist? Right now, I'll take someone who's fairly entry level, who's not afraid to get on the telephone and engage. You can't be afraid of the phone, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to pick up the phone and call and speak to someone that you've never speak, spoken to before, you don't know who they are, they don't know who you are, they may very well hang up on you, right? You kind of be afraid to do that. Um, some of it, the, the, the strategist, I, I definitely need some experience because what we're looking for is someone who can take a business challenge, like some of the challenges you and I discussed, right? Where we're having difficulty in identifying talent, whether it's uh, engineering or account executives or um, recruiters, right? Because even as a recruiting company, we need recruiters, right? Um, huge, huge uh, uh, supply shortage right now with those professions. So that person has to be able to kind of look at that bigger challenge and come up with a strategy, right? And some of it is very localized, very market specific. So how deep can we dig into a market to understand, number one, beyond market demographics, right? What are the things that are going to attract that individual to make us even want to talk to them? Right. Mm -hmm. Because I know we all have LinkedIn. Right. Mm -hmm. And we all get, you know, nice little notes from people. Hey, I saw your profile. How many of those have you really opened? Because you're fairly passive in your job right now. And especially if you're happy, you're not going to entertain it. Right. So that strategist has to be able to figure out, OK, how am I going to message and appeal to somebody in Canton, Mississippi versus Boston, Massachusetts? Because it's two different approaches that you have to take. So when I'm not wearing the sourcing leader hat, my other hat is talent diversity. Um, what that means essentially is my focus is on ensuring that, and let me just split this out really quickly. So there's Kelly, the organization that does temporary staffing, contingent workforce solutions, 
and we do that client facing, right? And then there's Kelly, the internal recruiting function that focuses purely on hiring people for Kelly. So over the course of a year, we hire more than 1,500 people directly for Kelly services, and that's globally, right? So just imagine, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the amount of effort that's required to get that number of people in-house. And it's really done with a small and agile team, right? Our recruiting team is only 20 people, right? Um, so when I'm not focusing on sourcing and making sure they get the talent that they need, I'm focused on talent diversity, right? So I'm looking very intentionally on, on where are we looking for talent, number one, right? And not just where are we looking, but how are we engaging with talent, right? Because it's important to understand that words matter, right? The way you do outreach, right? The way you engage, I reference Canton and I reference Boston. But more importantly, when you're talking about diversity, whether it's ethnic, whether it's generational, any dimension of diversity, it's important in terms of how you show up and how you reach out to people. So um, we have some technology tools and we have some strategy that we use uh, to ensure that um, we're, we're looking for things like harmful language, right? What are we saying? And I'll give you a great example. So um, our EVP um, referenced the word minority, right? And in general terms, in, in an EVP and the way we use minority, it's okay, right? Um, however, over time, using this, this tech platform, we discovered, and this is where, you know, some of that thought leadership comes in, we discovered that, you know, minority can be taken in a certain way as a deficit, right? So if you're saying to me, I'm a minority, like, what does that mean? And we essentially had to remove that from our AVP, right? Um, so I'm, I'm hyper-focused on, on that, but not just that, but really just, are we bringing in talent into the organization that's diverse? And that's diverse across all dimensions, right? I know we tend to be very narrowly focused when we talk about diversity around the visible, right? The things that we can see. Um, but we're looking much broadly than that as far as talent diversity is concerned. So that's a very, very long intro, but it kind of kind of shapes um, my role and what I, I do at Kelly. I've been there, as I've shared with some of you, um, 18 years, and I've held multiple different roles as an individual contributor in operations and now in uh, talent and leadership. So what we're going to talk about today is diverse perspectives, navigating workplace culture. That's kind of a big thing. What does that mean, right? Navigating workplace culture. How do we do that? What I often share with people that are joining the organization, especially as they come through uh, talent, now corporate recruiting, is that Kelly's culture is unique, right? As I think a lot of companies' cultures, right? You know, we kind of sit back and I know you guys are here and, and you're thinking, you know, OU's culture is unique, right? Um, but Kelly's culture is unique, very, very collaborative, very people focused, very collegiate, right? Everyone wants to help and everyone, you know, I, I don't think I've met a really bad person at Kelly. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've had, you know, professional disagreements, you know, um, different ideas, but I haven't met a person I'm looking at them like, I really don't like that person, right? So, you know, that's important, right? Because culture is important, but in understanding that, there's also parts of it that you need to know how to navigate, right? What does that mean, right? There, there's some, you know, general norms and some ebbs and flows and some, you know, uh, written and unwritten things that, that you have to understand. So we're gonna touch on some of those things later on as far as culture is concerned and what shapes that. Um, but before we get into that, there's a couple of things that I wanna go over. So uh, yeah. I'll, I'll ask the question to you, to, to the audience, what, what, what is OU's culture, right? And, and I know we have some staff and we also have students. So I'm very curious as to different perspectives from staff and student as to what they believe OU's culture is. So I'll, I'll start with the gentleman here, the student. Um, <clears throat> In my experience, OU's culture is like very relaxed. Uh, aesthetically, it's like friendly and warm. Um, the entire staff is like super welcoming. And like I can tell like it's like family oriented, like very um, collaborative culture, like from what I get from it. It's super, it's super, Mild and it's, uh, I can't think of the word. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very mild in just the way that it makes you feel because I mean, it, it depends that some days it's like a lot busier than other days, and like the I don't know, it's, it's, it's a good feeling. Overall. Okay, good feeling. 
Okay. So I'll ask as as as. I, 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 I think he was almost there. That the very, uh, as you were saying, collegial, and I think there was a great bunch of people here. Mm -hmm. Hardly any disagree, uh, hardly any fights. Right, right. Okay. right. There are uh, there should be disagreements, but uh, I think he hit the uh, nail on the head on that. Okay, general agreement. That, how did that come about? How did that culture come about? Like, what do you guys think generates that culture? Well, I think um, one of the things that we we use a lot in career services is we'll talk about like this group we quit, right? So I think that geographically, um, our university attracts students who are doing other things like, you know, maybe they've got an internship and like a part-time job mm -hmm. and they're being involved on campus. And so we've got these students who are like working hard. I think that lends itself to a uh, authenticity mm -hmm. that might then in turn <laughs> lend itself to some of the things that you're talking about. So I think that that culture of like that grit, that work ethic and that like, you know, um, and like a maturity too, right? Yeah, like the, the maturity piece, we're largely commuter, mm -hmm. right? Which is, um, I think is a, a strength, makes, it makes us strong in many ways. Right. So those are just a few. I'll just add a uh, community centric, uh, very yep. tight knit mm -hmm. community feel because we are embedded in Rochester Hills, mm -hmm. uh, Auburn Hills. It's a great connection to the community, mm -hmm. uh, not only on campus, but off campus. Right, right. And it was students when I first joined, um, the number of students like holding a door when you're passing through, whether for a fellow student or a faculty or a staff member, doesn't matter who it is, it could be a total stranger, but right. the politeness and the, the courtesy and care that I see individuals giving each other all over the campus right. really impressed me early on. And that may be similar or different from experiences you've had at other organizations, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's something there, right, that got OU to this point, and we'll, we'll kind of touch on that a little bit later. So uh, I'm going to go over code switching, imposter syndrome, personal brand, company culture, and then some final, uh, some final thoughts. Uh, this is a shared experience, right? And this is not going to be a lecture. It's not a TED talk. <laughs> you know, this is going to be very conversational. You know, we're going to engage and share our insights and all learn from the collective uh, experience that we're going to have today, right? Um, some of this is, is, you know, informational, some of it is opinion, some of it is my own experience, right? Um, so we're going to run through these and, and keep it very conversational. And if you have questions and, and, you know, you have a thought, some insight you want to share, please feel free. It's not, you know, you don't have to feel like you can't interrupt, right? So code switching. Um, definition there, kind of a loosely based definition, but more importantly, what I what I want to ask is is your thought, your idea of what code switching is, and if you've ever had to do it. So, and, and feel free, anybody can volunteer. I'm not going to go around the room. If you have a thought and some insight you want to share, please feel free. Um, okay. I actually, I think uh, recently uh, I was in Mexico, and uh, you know, you go to a restaurant. The person is struggling to, you know, so you sort of try to adapt or adopt their, you know, way of speaking, mm -hmm. and they were trying to adapt to my way of speaking. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, and it's not just language, I can see. Right. There are others, you know, maybe uh, non-verbal cues. Mm -hmm. Right. Any other thoughts, code switching, mm -hmm. when you've had to use it personally? I do. I believe code switching is very important to, um, uh, building up who you are mm -hmm. and the people around you because our code switch, we all code switch every day, all day because we, it depends on different groups and cultures that you mix yourself in. But our code switch, the, the largest one that I see myself doing is um, obviously I'm here at OU Rochester, mm -hmm. Bruce, but I'm also from Detroit. Right. So just the difference in the uh, like the way you pronounce the word will, will define the way that. He understands it versus the way a cousin of mine understands sure, it. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. it the yeah. the word. Mm -hmm. Very important. Um, and it's real. It is. Mm -hmm. It is. Great, great, great point. Great call. Yeah, and I think if we're, if we're speaking specifically tied to like the workplace, mm -hmm. um, we, I think that there's like a general idea of like, and we call, we call it the question, right? Like, what do we consider to be professional? Like, mm -hmm. What is that? term mean it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people 
And I also have a background in communication studies where I, we looked at culture and we looked at like relations of power. And you know, mm -hmm. so what, you know, what does professionalism mean? How right. is that tied to larger societal institutions and structures right. and like power dynamics at play? Mm -hmm. And so just kind of, like, you know, even like looking at that specifically through the lens of the workplace, um, that's one way that I look at it. Right. There's multiple ways, but that's one way. Absolutely. Absolutely. Given the context of the work environment, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So, so that's, that's very interesting because when you put it in the context of the work environment and we tend to your point, what, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Dave Young. Dave Young. When you put it in, in context of the work environment, because we do code switch in our personal lives, right. As well as professional lives. Right. I often, I, I used to mentor back in New Jersey. Um, I used to mentor this, this group of, of um, high schoolers. They're kind of like high school, just getting ready to graduate and kind of figuring out what they wanted to do with their, their lives. And I would remind them that there are certain behaviors that you exhibit with your friends that you don't do in front of your grandmother. Why is that, right? Because you understand there's a time and place and there's acceptable behaviors for certain things, right? So code switching, good, bad, or necessary, I think it's a little bit of all of it, right? There's some good in it, right? Because why do we do it, right? Why, why do we make this decision to alter ourselves, right? Because there's some either perceived good and benefit in doing it. Like you said, Davian, I'm here at OU, right? And I wanna present myself in a certain way because part of that is acceptance, it's belonging, right? I, I kind of see and I evaluate the social landscape and I understand that, you know, part of that contract, right? Of fitting in means that I have to alter some of my behavior, right? I'm not going to operate in the same way as I would if I'm with my friends, right? Um, so some of it is, is this perceived uh, a benefit of good. Some of it is to kind of separate yourself from the perceived benefit of negative, right? Because there are certain stereotypes that come with being part of, you know, socioeconomics, as part of, you know, race and ethnicity, as part of gender, right? There's, again, and we go through all the diverse dimensions, right? Whether neurodiverse or otherwise, there are certain negative stereotypes that come with those things, right? And part of code switching is to separate ourselves, right? From the negative stereotype, almost like I am not that, right? Type of approach. So there's good, bad, and it's necessary, right? Because some of it is necessary, right? To your point, Emily, you know, you kind of establish companies establish as part of their culture, um, some of these social norms and power dynamics. And, you know, um, it, it depends on, on what that means. And we'll, again, dive into that a little bit later. So to me, you know, when, when my, my experience with code switching is, is a funny one, it's, it's two things that come to mind immediately. Um, as I shared with the, the assistant dean, I'm from the West Indies. So I grew up in this little country way, way south, right? Little island country, way south in the Caribbean, southernmost before Venezuela. So Venezuela is the next largest landmass off to the east is Barbados, right? Um, most people wouldn't even find it on a map. Mm -hmm. And I get here to United States and it's culture shock, right? Everything is big and new and you know, nothing's familiar. And I have this funny, cool accent that I like think is cool. <laughs> we all think it's cool, right? <laughs> yeah. But no one else looks, sounds, and is speaking like me. Right. And I start feeling this pressure and this, you know, some of it self-induced, some of it real. Right. And you learn to adapt and you learn to, you know, when I'm with my parents and I'm comfortable, you know, my accent is, is, is in full display when I'm in a business environment or I'm in certain environments. So there's that, that need to code switch. The other thing I, I remember is living in New Jersey when I worked for Kelly, uh, no interest in golf. I couldn't even tell you where a golf course was if it was in my backyard. <laughs> didn't, didn't, had no interest. Moved to corporate, and that's the thing. I, I, I wasn't in corporate two days, and everyone was like, hey, so you're going to play in the Kelly? I'm like, what, what, are we, what, are we, what are we talking about? You know, Kelly outing is coming up, and we got to get a foursome to get, because that's where proximity to power and the power dynamic, right? Because the executives played golf, right? And everybody wanted to play in the golf league because that was their opportunity to get FaceTime. With the, with, with the right people, the decision makers. And yeah, fortunately I, I love golf now, but you know, that was a, that was a, a switch that I had to make. And, and you know, even as I think through Kelly's evolution, right? Um, and, and some of it is, is culture, but so I'll leave it for later. Um, but as I think through that evolution, there are times when, you know, you sit in a room and you're evaluating the landscape. So it's not even from, you know, uh, 
a cultural shift from coming from the West Indies or, or playing golf or moving from New Jersey to here, but sometimes in the room that you're in, you're evaluating the landscape and making those decisions, right? So the only problem with code switching, when it really, to me, in my opinion, becomes negative, is how much of yourself do you give away, mm -hmm. right? Because some parts of it, when it becomes uh, a production, if you will, then you seem inauthentic, right? And then you disconnect yourself from what is truly you and what is culturally you and what makes you unique, and right? Like your core, right? Exactly. You don't exactly. want to lose that. Absolutely. You want to stay centered, right, in that and remember your values and what makes you you, right? And make the, the, the micro adjustments as you go on. Any additional thoughts? What do you guys think? Are you uh, it makes sense to me. Yeah. And it so, feels like it's deeply rooted in us, right? Probably going back many, many generations right. from like a, how we're wired as human beings. Right. In in a room, any any setting, right? That right. we put ourselves into. Right. right. That we're adapting in real time and sometimes consciously, many times subconsciously. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing, right? And that's a great point. You know, um, I know a lot of times when, when I talk about this and, and I'm having conversations with other individuals, you know, we tend to, 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 you know, singularize code switching as this thing that people of ethnicity and racial, you know, uh, racial backgrounds have to do. That happens to all of us, right? We don't have a monopoly on any of it, right? Any of the things we're talking about today, it crosses across, you know, um, you know, culture and race and ethnicity, gender, all the way across. One of the other areas I was just going to mention, we, we work with students in our office is the intervention about interviews, right? So mm -hmm. they got to bring their best foot forward. Mm -hmm present themselves in a great way to address through uh, behavior, through action, through their confidence, but showing your true genuine person. Absolutely. So that you can make an impact in the organization. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Because what is unique about you, right, is your value, right? Ian has very specific values, so does Emily, and so on and so on, right? So still being true to who you are, right? But like you said, making, making those, those little adjustments as you go along. All right, this one, I love this one, imposter mm -hmm. syndrome, right? I think we all, yeah, this shows up in, in, in all our lives, even you know now, today, right, in, in many different ways. So uh, again, I'll throw it out to the room. Thoughts on this and, 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 and some of your own experiences on, on imposter syndrome? Um, well, I think that we've, everyone experiences it, you know, to a certain, it might be just like context, Right, mm -hmm. um, like certain situations, and um, I think I think it's tough because especially when you 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 know you work really hard to achieve something, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden, like you, you work so hard, you like nose to the grindstone, and you were really committed, and I've really experienced that even in my own life, and then I achieve the thing that I want, and then I look back and I'm like, you know, sometimes you're in a room and you're like, do I deserve to be in this room? And you know it, you do. But then it, it's kind of like that, you know, comparison to the folks around you mm -hmm. because seeing the value that other people bring, sometimes it can, you know, and I don't think there's any, I think we all experience it, right? right? And so it's kind of just like that um, comparison element, like comparing yourself to the people around you, not realizing that you're at that table too mm -hmm. for a reason. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think we, we all in a variety of ways probably have experienced it to a degree. Um, but like what you have up here on the screen, you know, it affects all different kinds of people, like maybe tied to some elements of social identity and, and um, you know, who's to say what elements of the social identity impact ones, you know, how they experience imposter syndrome. Right, right, so. right, absolutely, absolutely. I think it's big too, and I'm one of them, and I know I'm not the only one in the room about like first gens, students right that right. are going to be the first in their family right. to get a higher education degree and even though you might do that and you get in there and you make it happen you still feel sometimes a little bit not quite like am i am i worthy of being at this table right because it never came before me right so even though i did not earn it there's still a piece of you that can kind of you know feel imposterish absolutely um, absolutely as one example yeah no that, that's a great two great examples and the interesting thing about imposter syndrome, right? Um, again, this is kind of a loose definition. You go out there and you do the research, and they'll, I mean, they'll give you tons of data around, you know, people's experiences with it. Um, the interesting thing about imposter syndrome, in, in, and I'll, I'll use myself as an observation, is that there's two ways it shows up, right? It's your own internal narrative, right? It, it's it's what you believe about yourself. To your point, Emily, it's like 
I know I've put in the work and I know I've done these things and, and, and but I'm still here. And it's like, there's like being, I go back to, you know, um, grammar school and, and you're like sitting in class and everybody's smarter than me. So I'm, I'm just not gonna say anything because I'm gonna sound stupid and everybody, and we all are in the same class doing the same thing, right? Because none of us are feeling that confident. So it's your own internal narrative. And that's driven by a number of things, right? So let me give you an example. Um, growing up in the West Indies, grandparents, right? I, I, I put them in the traditionalist generation, right? So we talk about 40s um, or thereabout. And my grandfather got up every day at 5.30. And he got up every day at 5.30, even though he didn't have to be to work till eight. But in his mind, I am never gonna be late. So if I miss my ride and I have to walk, still gonna be on time. And he did that every day for 30 years. Right. He would send my grandmother and I on vacations. He would not take a vacation. But for him, that was his representation of what work meant to him. Right. And it was his burden to carry, right? For for you know, all that came after him, right? As the example of what work meant to him, right? My father came to the US at 19. My father for years got up at six o'clock every day, worked 12 hour days, right? very rarely would miss a day, but would take vacations. I, I give him that. Um, my grandfather told me, always oh, gotta give 110%. And, and you know, I know you guys have heard it, but specifically, it, you know, with people of, of color, you know, we get told, you know, you have to work as twice as hard as, as you know, your, your, your other colleagues to, to be successful, right? And what that does to your internal narrative is tells you that if I'm not accomplishing, or if I'm not being excellent, then I'm failing, right? By high bar. It's a very and 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 that's that's the that's the point. Great call out, Ian. You know, while those things are well intentioned, and there's some ethic in there in terms of work ethic that I want to pass along to my children, um, I think it psychologically sets this very high bar. To your point, Ian, that is almost impossible to achieve, right? And if that is your primary focus. And, and nothing but excellence is good enough, right? And, and they break down imposter syndrome in terms of the number of different individuals. You have perfectionists and you have soloists and you have the Superman, Superwoman, you know, all, all in the breakdown. And a lot of times I see myself in that, right? Because it's like, okay, I have to be, if I'm doing this presentation, it has to be spot on because my name is attached to it. It has to be perfect. And I used to spend hours sometimes just going through every single detail. And at some point I recognized that that's not productive, mm -hmm. right? And you've kind of set a standard of excellence for yourself that people have become accustomed to, right? And they expect that from you now. So sometimes, you know, um, perfection is not the goal, right? Good enough, right? Mm -hmm. Now my father would disagree, right? He'd tell you, no, good enough is not good enough. <laughs> it has to be perfect. But in, in, in terms of what this means, as far as imposter syndrome is concerned, sometimes good enough is good enough. You have to tell yourself, you know, I remind myself that I didn't get to Kelly because they just like me. I'm a good person. I know I'm a good person. I think people like me, but that's not why they pay me, right? There's value in some of the things that I bring, and they recognize that value, and that's the exchange for everyone here in this room, right? The, the other part of it, too, is some of it is environmental, right? It, it is beyond your internal narrative, right? I had a, a, a regional manager of mine, I remember this clearly, getting ready to make the jump to Michigan, and um, went to her, and I said, look, you know, VP reached out to me. The role that we were discussing, that fell apart. She wants me now to move to Michigan, take on this much bigger role. And she said to me, I don't think you're ready for that. Do you think you're ready for that? And that kind of put this fear in me now. Like, am I ready for that? Am I ready? <laughs> and before I was excited because the VP was like, I had you targeted for this role, but that fell apart moved to Michigan, and now I'm contemplating, how am I going to call my wife and tell her, hey, we're moving to Michigan. We're, we're six months into marriage. Come with me to a state that we don't know anything about. And now I go to, to my regional manager and she's like, you know, put this, this fear in me. So some of it is your internal narrative, but some of it is external as well, right? Some of it is, you know, being in spaces where you are the only one, right? And that is not just about, you know, race or ethnicity. Sometimes that's gender. Sometimes that's generational, right? where you find yourself in a room and you're like, do I really belong here? Not from the physical presence, but you know, uh, am I capable enough, right? Mm -hmm. And the thing that I remind myself all the time, one of the things is that 
you know, Kelly doesn't pay me just because I'm a nice guy, right? I have value. I put in the work, right? And I had to remind myself when my original manager told me that I was getting up every day and going up to upstate New York when we launched the Pepsi MSP. Before anybody wanted to do that work, I was out there. We were filing time cards on, in paper and I was reconciling time cards. So I put in the work, right? I had to remind myself of that. And that's what we have to do too, right? We have to remind ourselves that we're here with purpose, right? We're in this room because we belong here. We put in the work, right? Or we have the right credentials, right? We, we have value, more importantly. So this one, we're always gonna experience this, right? Because we're always, we're always gonna have new experiences, right? New things, new challenges that are presented to us, right? Whether it's work or, or uh, a new assignment, a new project, right? You might be collaborating with, you know, uh, people from other teams that, you know, credentially might be, you know, uh, uh, higher than you, if you want to view it that way. So you're always going to have a little bit of this. When we don't dwell in this is when we're able to move forward, right? Because doubt, self-doubt is normal. As long as we're not dwelling in it, as long as we're reminding ourselves that there's value in what we bring to the table, we'll be fine. Any other final thoughts there? Yes. Yeah, I, I have some thoughts. So I think that um, one of the we look at some of the you know silver linings of the COVID era. Mm -hmm. One of those is I think we, we view the work-life balance differently and how we approach work and the conversations around like mental health and self-care. And I think that that kind of ties into this a little bit because when I think about sometimes when I think about imposter syndrome, I think about that larger uh, societal um, notion of like hustle culture. Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. if you're not hustling and yep. you're not doing not just this, but this and this and this and this, yep. like are you going to make it? Yep. And so that idea of hustle culture just has been so ingrained in people that just hustle, 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 when really that's that, that's not healthy in a lot of ways. And so I'm just noticing like on social media and just like in conversations and at the university level, there's so much more of a focus on, wait, no, rest not because you know it's not a treat you deserve it you right. need it right and so and they set conversations around mental health like it's okay to not be okay i mean think about the last like 18 months or so and so to me when we think about imposter syndrome it uh just kind of like the era that we're in right now mm -hmm. and like i think about hustle culture a lot and if you're not like going so hard then something's wrong with you exactly and I, I think that narrative is changing now mm -hmm. a little bit yeah a little bit, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's 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 so ingrained that I think it's an over time thing. But yeah, and here's here's why it's changing, right? So two things on that point. That's the soloist and and the Superman, Superwoman, right? Because we feel that if we don't do everything, if we don't take on every project, we're going to be exposed, right? People are going to recognize, well, are they really as good as as you know we think they are? Or they claim to be, right? Soloist, you know, we want to we want to do it ourselves. Make sure you know we we keep all of it you know, before we, we, we let it out. But to your point, that's changing a little bit. And it's changing because we are demanding that it change, right? So mm -hmm. we were having some conversation earlier, right? You know, we, we come out of these economic cycles. And as long as I've been in staffing, I've seen it come and go, right? You have the employer market, right? Where the employers hold all the cards and, you know, um, they, they get short memories. And then you have you know, the employee market. And right now we're in the employee market, right? And people are recognizing coming out of COVID that why am I killing myself? Mm -hmm. I, like and that I'm, pendulum swings a bit, right? Right. But now we have a little bit more leverage so we can make demands, right? Because there's a supply and demand issue as far as talent is concerned. Um, and, and companies want to retain that talent. But in addition to that, it's not just so cynical, right? That, that employers are recognizing the need to do that. I think employers are recognizing that when you have a staff that's engaged, right, then you have more productivity, right? And if you're hiring the right people, you can give them some of that leeway, right? Exactly. Like the hybrid work environment or whatever that is. If you've hired and trained them well and you've got good people on the team, you know, right. I, think, I think that proves itself out. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, in order for people to be engaged, right, they have to feel well, they have to feel good about self, right? They have to be able to, um, you know, as, as we'll talk a little bit about later, you know, be able to be authentic and, and, and be who they are at work, right? And that has many meanings, but we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, moving along. 
And thank you guys. Great, great comments and insight. I appreciate it. Personal brand, this is the one I love. Um, so when you see this, what do you think about it? What, what does this mean to the individuals in the room? Because I have my own thoughts, but I want to get your thoughts. I think it's about how you want to hear other people because we are like face value creatures. Uh, and then it's about how you make them feel as well. And that comes after you speak. So I can sit over here like this and I'm not. I'm branding myself a certain way, but you're not giving me full brand until I speak. Mm -hmm. And then once I speak, you're able to complete whatever you think. So I think it's just um, everything you physically, whether it's, it's it's what you give off or it's well, it's all the same. It's it's depending on how other people view you, mm -hmm. how you make them feel. And uh, it's all physical. Yeah, so there's a there's actually a workshop that I'll sometimes do on personal branding, and I love this topic. Too. Okay, so let's, like, let's go. Let's go. Right I love it. And so usually when I ask this question of students, um, they have a, a lot of a lot of responses. And one of my favorites that students say, and, and that I will, if they don't say, I'll say, is how people talk about you when you're not in the room. Mm -hmm. So how are you seeing? What are the things that people say about you? How 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 are you perceived? Mm -hmm. and I think another thing about personal brand too. Um, at least I, I'm just going to be like real. Mm -hmm. My experience is there. There I think there are people, and everyone is different. Who can separate that work piece of you and like that personal piece of you? And for me, there's a lot of blending mm -hmm. with that. Mm -hmm. So for so for me for me personally, a part of personal branding is bringing like you you use the word authenticity, mm -hmm. like bringing that human element mm -hmm. of you and becoming relatable in, do, in doing so. Right. So. Good stuff. Uh, it will not be exactly related to what you have here, but a uh, lot of my advice, the PhD advisor always, you know, this is telling me that, you know, Rajiv, you're always selling yourself. Mm -hmm. You sell yourself to your wife, you sell yourself to your kids, you sell yourself to your officers. Mm -hmm. And I kind of uh, got the idea behind it. Mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't mean that you have to be inauthentic, but right. uh, at the same time, you have to present a kind of brand uh, image yeah. uh, to mm -hmm. different uh, uh, folks. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you're not wrong, it is in context of what personal brand is. So every point that was made is, is actually spot on. So putting personal brand in, in, in in context of the professional environment, you know, when when I talk to folks, whether as an individual contributor, when I recruited and I'm talking to a candidate or I'm doing sessions like these, whether internal at Kelly or externally, you know, what I I, I say to people is, you know, if, if we think and 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 Dave Young's wearing a Nike hoodie and some Nike sneakers, and you know, if we think in terms of, of what that means, right? To me, Nike is a marketing company that makes sportswear. <laughs> not the other way around they are a marketing company that makes sportswear and they've become geniuses mm -hmm. at marketing to us right and hey because i i'm i'm like even their website like i'm a, I'm a fanboy of their website from a diversity perspective because i think them and procter and gamble they have they, they do a fantastic job of of how they present you know talent diversity at at those organizations but what what I mean by Nike as a as a marketing company is that they, they're almost synonymous with, with with certain things now when we think of Nike, right? You know, there's a certain amount of style and swag, but there's a certain amount of performance. Because if you, I'll give an example. I'm not a runner, but I'm sure if I talk to runners, they'll tell me that there's tons of other running shoes that are much better than Nike. But me, if I think about a running shoe, I'm going to Nike. Why? Because they've done a great job of marketing to me and the things that I like and the things that appeal to me. And whether it's from a fashion perspective or, or you know, just a convenience, whatever it is, they've done a great job, right? They've created this brand. And we can go down the list of great brands that we know that have done the same thing, right? We all make decisions day to day, right? Uh, you know, buying decisions. And, and we as, as whether we're, we're, we're employees or candidates or you know, we all make buying decisions every day too, in the same way. So personal brand. What I tell people this really means is to your point, what do people think about you when you're not around, right? How do you show up, right? What are you known for, right? And, 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 and here's how this plays itself out. So at Kelly, 
over time, I've kind of crafted this brand, right? Where people know Marvin is good at this thing, right? He has some subject matter expertise and it's through work and it's through, you know, collaboration with other teams and networking and that sort of thing. But now I'm known for this thing, right? That's my personal brand. And what I do, I cultivate it at Kelly and then I cultivate it externally. If you look at my LinkedIn, right? I'm very careful about what I post and what I post and, and, and part of that is cultivating that brand. So if you are known for being good at PowerPoint or good at presentations, right? Whatever that thing is that you do very, very well at your job that people kind of like, you know what, if you need help with that, go to Ian because Ian has carved out this space as this subject matter expert in that area, right? That is your personal brand in a professional environment. And it is critically important. And it comes in with, like you said, how you show up in certain environments. How do you network, right? How do you present yourself, right? So that when people are not in that space that you're in, right? And they're thinking about the next project or the next thing. Oh, you, let me call Davion, right? This is critically important at work because if you don't have proximity to power, and here's what I mean by that. Right now I'm at HQ, right? I have proximity to power, all the executives and all. So I can show up at HQ and I can get FaceTime. But if you don't have that, like when I sat in New Jersey, right? And nobody knew who I was. If you don't craft and create your brand and carve out this niche of expertise and start promoting that, then you're just the guy in New Jersey that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. So this is very, very important, right? Especially in this hybrid or virtual world. Absolutely. Right? even more so, but more so, but this environment helps, right? Because now it, it, it kind of closes that, that, that proximity to power a lot more, right? Because now I can get on a Zoom call with a senior executive and whoever else, so uh, an executive in, in one of my international colleagues, right? Whereas in the past, I may not have been able to do that in a very convenient way. So again, it, it, it amplifies it, but it also gives us the opportunity to do it a lot easier, right? So that's why, you know, you start building this. And if and, and I would encourage everyone, um, and it, it's not just in the walls of your organization, right? If you have a LinkedIn or any type of other professional environment, um, networking events, webinars, seminars that you go to, Consultants I highly and encourage you to start crafting your brand, right? Because when no, just, just go ahead, make one point. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So you know, we receive resumes for uh, you know faculty positions, and oh. once or twice I saw that you know, the email the email listed was you know abc one two three four at gmail.com, mm -hmm. and you get turned off so so much by this mm -hmm. ad, but because you know, do you not even know that uh, <laughs> your email address should mean something? It should. Right? Mm -hmm. It should. It should. And that's a great point. I I do a whole nother um series of presentations around you know interview skills and resume building and that sort of thing and, and it's usually for either you know college level or, or high school students i tell them the same sometimes it's professional uh individuals as well who are in transition i tell them the same thing right if you have a personal email that's i am sassy at gmail that's cool. keep, keep that right you know, but so important for me to see. because that's still you right you know you might be sassy keep that but don't put it on your resume create a professional email address right your LinkedIn should be updated, right? Do not wait until you are looking for a job no. to update your resume or your LinkedIn. That because you're scrambling trying to figure out all the things that you've done. I tell people catalog all your accomplishments as they happen. If you've got to create one big long word document, catalog all your accomplishments, new projects, things you've done, new responsibilities, anything that adds value to what you do, catalog it, right? And at some point, go through the process of either again branding, putting that out there on LinkedIn, right? You know, I see people with LinkedIn pages and, you know, it's like one liners, you know, um, you know, talent diversity manager, right? What are we? <laughs> I don't know what that is. Because, you know, for certain organizations, that's a very, that, that might be a very internal title. It means nothing to the external marketplace until you, you, you explain it, right? Mm -hmm. or, or they'll they'll have a LinkedIn profile that they haven't touched in four years, right? And if you think a recruiter, or a hiring manager, or HR professional, or any one of these people that do hiring from any company is not looking at your LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good luck. Well, one of the things that you said that I think, I think is important for students to hear mm -hmm. is that it's like, and I, I <laughs> when we're talking about this subject, I will use this as an example. Mm -hmm. I'll say, 
Is anyone here an athlete? Has anyone ever played in the sport? There's always students who say, yes, I played basketball, I did this. Would you ever go, would you ever just like wait to practice for a game for the day off? Right. No, you never would do that. Right. So I love what you said about this shouldn't be, like if you're getting ready to start your personal brand when you're getting ready to start a job search, you're behind. You're late. Right, and so like even now, I, I'm, I love my career. I am not on a job search, but I'm constantly personally branding myself. Absolutely. I'm going to update my LinkedIn all the time. I'm going to go to networking events just because personal branding also, in my view, isn't something that's just like, what can I get from this? Right. But it's also like, I don't know who's here who I could help. Absolutely. So I, I just, I think it's really important what you said about it has to be like a continuous process. And if, and if you're waiting to do it until you're desperate, that's going to make the job or internship search that much more stressful and Absolutely. tough. So I, I just really love that point that you made. Yeah, if I would ask Ian, you know, to recall, you know, a project or a success from two years ago, you might get a big one, mm -hmm. but he's not going to remember all the little ones, ones. Mm -hmm. right? So you have to catalog them and yeah. keep them fresh. The other thing about personal branding to when I'm talking to students um, and people who are in transition is the personal brand, there's the positive, right? Which is what we're talking about right now. And then there's the negative, right? And part of your personal brand is what's out there for public consumption, right? So I know sometimes we get into these environments where you know we feel that we must express every emotion that we have, right? We must put it out there publicly for it everyone to see. I would say, share it with your spouse, your neighbors, your friends, people who are close to you, and control the narrative. Keep that narrative within your inner circle, right? Because once it gets out there, I don't care who you are, you lose control of that narrative. And again, much like recruiters and HR people and hiring managers are going to LinkedIn to understand, because they don't make hiring, they can't make a hiring decision based on one data point, which is LinkedIn or your resumes. It's, you know, um, all of that collectively put together, but it is an important data point. Conversely, if there are negative, negative things out there, things that might be questionable on your social media, you know, I see people now, you know, talking politics and LinkedIn, and I just said, I sit down, and I, it's funny to me because I'm like, you clearly are rich and, and have no interest in, in furthering your career because, you know, I know some people think, oh, it's not that important. It really is. It is really important, right? I can't believe that you know, somebody believes that uh, putting your political thoughts out there and sometimes the very really strong language yeah. is not going to impact yeah. you. Yeah. 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 It's an emotional so release at the time, but you're not winning anybody over it. at all. And all the people who agree with you already agreed with you. I told my kids, you know, it doesn't matter who you vote for. It doesn't matter which party you believe in. Yeah. Just don't put that thing on your resume or add your resume. Yeah. Go for it. Because it, it, listen, all of that's healthy and that's still part of who you are authentically, right? But there's but, a place for it. But there's a place for it, right? And and some of that stuff, you know, you, you know, it needs to be kind of, of like I said, I, I tell my team all the time, listen, come and vent to me, mm -hmm. right? Because it stays here. We control the narrative. The moment you go and vent elsewhere. Right, you've lost control because you don't know what that version of, of, of what you said is going to get translated into, where it's going to go, and before you know it, it circles back and it's some, something completely different from where you started. Right, so so keep that stuff in house. Um, personal brand. Just to recap, let's make sure we're crafting it right. There's things we all bring into the table that that is expertise, right? And while others may have you know similar expertise, the way you do it, you're unique perspective on things, your insight is unique to you, right? So make sure you're kind of taking hold of that and, and crafting that carefully. Um, and don't be afraid to share. I, I know people that, you know, will sit in a meeting and not say a word. I'm like, you, you have, I mean, this, you do this every day. I, I know you're good at this. They just sit there, all right, cool, yeah, not me. I'm, I got some insight I'm sharing. That's my personal brand. All right, moving along. All right, so we talked a, a little bit about this early on um, as far as OU's culture is concerned and what culture um, looks like, right? But, you know, behavioral norms, it's the company's values, their mission statement, you know, policy and, be, you know, all, all, the, all the great things that, that kind of are written and we understand as a new employee, you know, they give you the big, thick handbook back in the day. Now it's, you know, digital 40-page thing that you have to read through and, and sign off on. So it helps you understand, you know, 
the expectations, right? But bigger than that, company culture is really driven by the people, right? Because you can write whatever you want in the book, right? The people really are the ones that, in terms of their behaviors and how they interact with each other, how they engage, are the ones that really decide what your culture is, right? So, you know, you have companies, um, and it's, it's shifting a little bit, but particularly in the financial inst institutions, right? Financial industry, they're very traditionalist, right? So it, it's, it's a certain look, it's a certain, you know, behavior and, and so forth versus tech, right? Tech is innovation and, you know, they, you know, we loosey goosey, you know, and, and, you know, back in the day used to be ping pong tables and free, you know, things for everybody. Yeah. Um, you know, versus uh, some culture, uh, company cultures that are, are leadership focused, right? So they want everyone to, to grow and develop, you know, this succession planning because they believe their best people come from within, right? And they're able, you know, they're able to grow uh, and, and retain people in that way. So company culture is important, right? Because for you coming into a new environment, right? What I often say to people is when you're evaluating an organization and, and, and Kelly knows this, and, and I believe OU knows this too, um, some companies don't. Right now, especially in this environment, people are evaluating your culture before they made it, make a decision. I, I had a conversation with Ian um, and, you know, before we, we, were, we were discussing coming here today and, you know, I, I'm happy at Kelly, right? I'm as passive as, as you know, a candidate uh, you can find on, on LinkedIn, right? Um, so when I get these pains from people, I'm often, you know, not interested, but if it's a company that, that captures my interest because it's some, you know, something about the company. Like I said, I'm a fanboy for Nike and Procter and Gamble in terms of what they're doing with diversity. Um, Procter and Gamble was the first one to publish their diversity data. And it was like, oh my God, they actually put that for everyone to see how terrible they were. Right. And it was genius because they acknowledged that, listen, we, we recognize where we are. Right. And we're admitting that we're not good, but here's what we're committed to do. And here are the goals that we're going to set and we're going to keep publishing so you can hold us accountable. Genius, right? So when I see companies like that and, and there's something about them or, or maybe something there that, that captures my interest and, and you know, we may engage in an informational conversation because if it's not for me, I always think of my network, right? Is there someone in my network that can benefit from, from this informational conversation that I can pass the information on to? Um, but I'm always evaluating company culture, right? And the first thing I do is I go to the company website, right? And I go to the about section, mm -hmm. right? And I start reading through, right? And if nothing there tells me about what your IND initiatives are, not for me, right? Because at this point in my career and what I wanna do, right? That's very important for me. So if it's not on your website, I'm not saying that you're not doing it, but it doesn't help me. And I don't wanna take the time to find out what you do, right? I should be able to glean a little bit of information about what you're doing with IND, right? Um, there are other things that I look for that I'm not gonna say publicly here, but there are things that I look for when I'm looking at your website. And if I don't see it, then it tells me that representation doesn't matter to you and representation is important. For me, I'm not speaking for anybody else in the room. Everyone has their own gauges of what that means, but for me, representation is important. So what companies are starting to understand is Culture is not always shaped by this, right? It's shaped by the employees. And if you cannot communicate out to the market what your culture is, you're not gonna win any talent, right? Because if you believe talent is not evaluating your culture before making a decision to come to you, then you're, you're struggling to find talent right now, right? Because people are making a lot of buying decisions based on information that's out there because it's available, right? You can go to Glassdoor, you can go to LinkedIn, you can go to, um, join a blank on the other side, but there's another site similar to Glassdoor. It gives you all the company information. It gives you company reviews. It's almost like Yelp for companies. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, uh, again, something related to this, from my stand, I'm, I'm not gonna name, name the companies, but mm -hmm. you know, so he was working for a large uh, public accounting firm. He quit that and he joined another company because he said, I, I don't like the culture. Don't like the culture. I was shocked. He said, what do you mean you don't like the culture? It's a great company. He said, no, I don't, I don't, I, I think I'm a misfit there. Right. And that, uh, that was it for him. Yeah. So yeah. I, he's not the only one. Right? 
to give you so many other examples that the heat, uh, heat were cheap, but uh, somebody else quit. So, absolutely. If I were to look for a job, I would do exactly the, the things you're talking about. Yeah. Go and, you know, and even talk to folks. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, yeah. And then that's what we do. You know, we collect all of this uh, uh, feedback, right, from trusted advisors and what's available outline to, out, out online to make that decision. It's like any other buying decision, right? You know, you're making a big purchase, you just don't go purchase the first thing you see, right? And what's interesting is that a lot of that was shaped, you know, by, by I'd say Gen Xers, right, mm -hmm. to a certain degree, but it's a lot of the, the generations behind that, right? Because they make the, the, they're making these decisions about, you know, I know I have talent, I have value, and I'm willing to bring it to you, but, you know, this is a bargain. Like, what is the exchange, right? What do I, I get from this in terms of how it aligns with, you know, whether it's my, my cultural beliefs, whether it's my social responsibility beliefs, whatever that might be, they're making those decisions, right? So culture is important, but it's important in the context of what we're talking about today, as far as I and D is concerned. Um, Kelly, for instance, decided to lead with inclusion when we started our journey, right? And again, I give Kelly credit for having vision because we have been doing work from home for more than five years, right? Um, we started our IND commitment, if you will, um, with my position in 2018. So we created this you know, new talent diversity position to focus specifically on saying, okay, if we are the ones that are on the forefront of you know, engaging with talent and, and sourcing talent, right? You, you know, we have to be intentional about diversity, right? Otherwise, what are we doing, right? Um, so I give Kelly credit for kind of seeing beyond and not waiting until there was an event to react, right? Um, but what we did as we kind of really formalized the, the overall strategy for the organization was start with inclusion. And why inclusion? Well, I would challenge anyone to go to any organization or company right now and say there's no diversity. There's a ton of diversity. Maybe not as much as we'd like in one dimension or the other, but there's diversity, right? In this room, there's diversity, right? So diversity is not the issue, right? What companies try to do and what they miss right, is the idea that if I hire, right, enough of one or the other, right, so they kind of hold the mirror up to themselves and say, okay, well, you know, we have X percentage of one dimension here, but as we go up the ranks of leadership, you know, we're, we're missing some, some pieces. So they go and they, they try to hire and, and fill that gap and think that that is a diversity initiative. And it's really not because diversity is not the issue in a lot of cases, right? Culture, is the issue and inclusion is the issue, right? So we decided to leave with inclusion. Why? Because if you have an inclusive culture, right? So not diversity, right? If people feel the diverse people in your organization feel like they are valued, they belong, they belong mm -hmm. right? Their input is important. What they bring to the table in terms of their unique perspectives is valued, right? Then the diversity piece doesn't solve itself, but guess what? It makes it a little bit easier because when people come, or you try to attract them and you signal out to the market that these are the things that we're doing, this is our culture. And you have employees that can you know, uh, uh, add to that in terms of, of tenure and testament that this is what's happening. Then people start, oh, okay, well now I'm interested, right? Right. And to we're gonna allow that 360 feedback loop. Right? Exactly. We wanna, we wanna hear from you. You're not just gonna do this transactional work and we get to check the box. Exactly, exactly, right? So what we started to do was kind of you know, figure out you know, where are we on this journey, right? You know, you know, there's there's this maturity curve that I think companies kind of all do and evaluate. And 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 it's important, but for us, it's okay, there's some foundational things that we need to set in place, right? From our people leaders, you know, senior executives and our people leaders. And and we did that over the course of time to say, okay, you know, it's important to have training and knowledge, right? So we did some unconscious bias training, we did some microaggression training and you know, well received and a lot of participation. And the thing is okay, where do you go from there, right? Because information is great, but if you're not taking action, information to action, right? Then we go through this cycle of, you know, we have the issue, you know, we do the training, we have the issue and we, because we're not taking any action. So right now with inclusion as the lead, what we're looking to do in terms of, of shaping and changing culture, because it's everyone's responsibility. I know people think, oh, it's a function of HR and the HR people drive it. And no, HR people kind of give you the tools and give you the information, but it's everyone's job, right? To shape the culture of the organization, right? And that's kind of where we are right now, trying to get everyone to understand that, you know, 
confront your own bias, right? Think of the things that 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 come to your mind when you're faced with a situation and stop, just pause and say, why, why am I thinking about this situation and this person in this way, right? What is it based on? Is it fact? Is it how I feel? Is this something that happened two years ago that may not be relevant today? So it's starting with the individual and that's kind of how we're trying to shape and change culture as far as inclusion and diversity and belonging is concerned. So at some point, you know, we're gonna see that shift, right? Because now what we're doing is uh, going into 2022 and 23, we're gonna task people leaders, right? So as long as you have uh, people reporting to you, you know, there's certain accountability and expectations around culture and how you manage your team and inclusion that's gonna be tied in, right, to performance. Because, right, mm -hmm. guess what? What gets measured gets managed, right? Um, so that's how we're gonna shape uh, this, this cultural piece. But it's important too for people, right, as we're doing this, right, to have that sense of, of, of feeling and belonging, right? So we're, we're also doing a bunch of engagement surveys and you know, trying to make sure that you know, we're, 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 we're tapping into the right things and not just taking it from this 30,000 feet and not checking in uh, at the right levels within the organization. So wh why do I say all of this? And I know we started with imposter syndrome. I mean, we started with, um, what did we start with? Code switching. Code, code switching and imposter syndrome. And, and then we talk about personal branding and now we talk about culture. What, what does this have to do with navigating corporate culture? Well, it all ties in, right? Because why? It's you, the individual, right? And how all of these things apply to you and how you use them to navigate corporate culture. Because guess what? You know, to your point, this is the right there, that you made with your son. You know, he sat back and he was like, nah. This is not for me, right? Something about that culture was not for him. And he made a decision to do what? Take his talents elsewhere. And not only did he do it, others did it. So for me, if I'm hearing that, right, and I'm not taking stock of that as the HR person or, or, or someone in leadership that I'm rec I don't recognize that I have a culture issue, guess what? I'm just going to keep losing people. And we're going to keep hiring people. We're just going to keep losing them. Zero to 180 days. That's when every employee is evaluating whether or not they made the right decision. To join your organization. So you have a from zero to 180 days to ensure that you get this piece right. Right? And they can vote with their feet. Absolutely. <laughs> especially now. Especially yeah. now. Right? The great resignation is the great shuffling, but you know, that's for another time. Right. Or not with their feet, now with their sun button. With this <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So final thoughts, right? I like this. You're a, be a yellow balloon, man. Just, you know, <laughs> the, you know, who wants to be, you know, all of this gray, you know, um, you know, there's something about being authentic that I think people gravitate towards, right? You know, people see that in you and, and they can connect with that, right? Because at, at the end of the day, you know, what imposter syndrome and, and code switching does, it, all of it is about connection and belonging and us wanting to make those connections with you know, people that we spend a huge amount of time with, right, throughout the day, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in person, right? We want to have that, you know, connection to our coworkers, right? Be authentic, right? Your swag, right? Who you are, you know, and, and some of it, you know, depending on the environment, I think, again, going back to your son, he's like, you know, Hey, I might be bringing my swag to work and they not they, they can't handle it. So guess what? I'm going to go somewhere else where they can, right? But you should be allowed to be you at work. Right? Especially in this environment that we in. Work does not shut off 9 to 5, right? That that work life balance that we like to talk about is work life flexibility now because it's blending in and out, right? So, you know, the day that I'm having a terrible day because I wake up and my water heater just you know, collapsed on me and my basement is flooded. I can't be expected to show up to work and have a chipper and cherry face. I'm still going to be professional, right? But I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with an issue that is still part of the authentic me, right? And you should be allowed to do that, right? You talk about confronting bias, right? That's part of shaping culture. You know, don't see something and let it go by because guess what? You continue to let it go by and the culture is never going to change, right? Modern inclusive behaviors, and, and the disruption part, right? You know, I everyone that comes through again as they pass through corporate recruiting, um, depending on what function they're going in, you know, I'm, I'm usually having some type of intro meeting with them. And I, I tell everyone the same thing. You're coming in with a different set of eyes, new perspective, question why. Always ask why. Why are we doing this? Why are we doing this? This does not make sense. Or I've seen it done elsewhere and it's better, right? And sometimes it's because people, mm, we've always done it this way. 
Or it might be a compliance reason why we're doing that. We can't change it. Or with some modifications, we can't. But always question why. Always be the, disruptive and challenge the status quo. I like that 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 statement. I don't know where I got it from. I I, I want to take credit for it, but it feels like I got it from somewhere. The whole paragraph. No, just the change never happens in the comfort of complacency. Yeah, yeah. it no, doesn't happen. Right. 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 Absolutely. It doesn't happen. No. So. Um, Thank you. I appreciate the invitation to come today and, and just share some of this information and um, hope it was of value. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was a very, very engaging, entertaining, thoughtful presentation with a great speaker. Thank you. And I'm glad that I stayed back and uh, I personally benefited so much from your uh, talk discussion. Thank you very much, Rajiv. Thank you so much for, uh, for being here. And I hope that, and we all hope that uh, you come back here. Uh, Absolutely. Some of the time. Invite me and I'll be back. And and really, I appreciate everyone's input. I, I, I love these sometimes, you know, when it's <laughs> it's intimate, you know, you get a lot of engagement and a lot of participation. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Yeah, you. Absolutely. Great. Awesome. That was great. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks again. So the second part of this last slide that yeah. during this pandemic, it's mm -hmm. made us all vulnerable. Everybody's seeing my home, my dogs, yeah, my kids, yes, yes. and it made me be more yeah, human. Absolutely. That right? I think staff and everyone's probably uh, oh, more so even the playing field oh, because we've been in a virtual environment. Mm -hmm. We're all exposed, right? Yeah, we, we have internet connection issues. Yeah. We have this issue that's happening. You're out of here. We're all human, and I think part of this pandemic.